Okay, everyone. Um, I'm Alana Hernandez. I'm the Curatorial Fellow here at MCASD. This is our redo of our Charla that ha what happened last month. Um, unfortunately, our, we have technical difficulties. I'm told Instagram servers across Southern California went out, so it's not our fault. Um, but I'm thrilled to be here with Julio again to speak about his work in Te Temo Wild Tongue, Art After Chicanismo. Um, so some brief, you know, tidbits. Um, the Charles happen on the occasion of Te Temo Wild Tongue, um, and, and I'm inviting artists to speak with me about their work that's in the show. Uh, before I get into anything, of course, I want to acknowledge that here from my office here in Sherman Heights, San Diego, I am on the traditional land of the Kumeyaay. So I'm thrilled today to be with Julio. Let me read a quick bio and then, um, and then I can introduce the show and the sections a little bit. Um, so Julio Cesar Morales was born in Tijuana but now lives in Arizona where he's a professor or excuse me, a curator at the ASU Art Museum, which is great. Um, and his practices focuses on issues of migration, labor, and personal and global economies on both, um, both of those scales. And he's really positioned himself as, as a uh, documentarian of people that move across the border. So I'm thrilled again to have you here. Um, and so, as I said, this Charla comes on the occasion of To Tame a Wild Tongue, our digital exhibition. You can see that at mcasd.digital. Um, and his work is, is luckily in two sections, um, in the labor section and in the border section. So the show is split into five thematic sections, activism, labor, rescuache, lo mexicana, and the border. Um, and so, I think we'll, what we'll do is we'll talk about the labor section first, um, and then we'll we'll move into your work in the border section. Um, so give me just a second. Let me share my screen, and then we can. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Great. How do I? Oh, it's this button. Perfect. Well, Julio, again, I'm I'm so thrilled. For you to be here again and thank you again for your time um we have like i said we have several works in in the show and this is from your formal economy series um which is supposed to be a vinyl installation that has kind of exploded against the wall um that you you began this series in um in 2002 i believe so i wonder if you you'll you know speak a little bit about this um and the inception of the series Okay. Um, I also want to acknowledge um, land where I'm at now, which is the Pima River people, Otaham. And um, okay, I'll go into the work. So, you know, this exhibition at the San Diego Museum of Contemporary Art, it was the first museum exhibition I actually um, had for a solo show, which was amazing. Yeah. And this body of work comes from being from Tijuana and going back and forth as a kid until my teens and we literally moved one block away from Zona Norte in Tijuana to San Isidro and so during this time I uh, ended up going to school to San Francisco to San Francisco Art Institute and I would go back and visit family and in the early 2000s I befriended um, Toro Lab, Raul Cárdenas, Tanya Candiani among other people when there was this amazing explosive movement happening in Tijuana and so I would regularly go and visit and on one of those visits, I actually um, realized that when I was being, um, I, I was hanging out with Raul from Toro Lab, we went by a couple of assembly plants. And within the assembly plants, it turns out that every Friday, the assembly plants put out um, items and things that they don't want that come from pallets and other shipping materials. And this material comes from Japan, Korea, Canada, and then what happens is that on Fridays, um, these people would come by and pick up the leftovers from the factory and they would end up creating vending carts. So I really love that idea of creating their own economy by using recycled materials from the maquilladoras. Mm -hmm. And some of these were just really beautiful sculptural pieces. And so I began tracking, interviewing, and taking photographs of these vending carts. And the vending carts had uh, three, process series which was one the photography two 
was an illustration of them, line drawing. And the third is I would cut them out with vinyl. So essentially you're seeing an exploded view from this image here. And essentially when these images, um, the vinyl pieces came back together again, they would actually construct the vending cart. There's also a video in the exhibition that showed the process of the explosion uh, of the vending carts that were shot in various parts of Tijuana. Yeah, that's incredible. I think, uh, you know, we spoke before about how your process, you really start um, from in photography, right? And and you have this, this you're kind of from this generation of street photographers, and then your process kind of moves from there. And I, I think before I show another image, it's something that um, this, the vendor, the cart vendor, and, and the idea of informal economies and how that sustains cities is an important thing and important um, under something to understand, right, as part of this series, but certainly I think as part of the show, right, we, I think there are many um, economies that exist that sustain cities that are not, um, uh, sorry, <laughs> my cat, um, that aren't incredibly um, noticed all the time. And I think it's, this is, you know, such a, a powerful piece. It takes up such a large space in the gallery to show these kind of these people that that uh, that it help society exist in this way, right? Um, and giving visibility to to this vendor in this case, right? And and these um, large size vinyl pieces are life size, right? So that vendor really is, you know, five foot five or five foot six, something like that. Right. And I, I love the the gesture. Basically, he's actually pushing the cart. Mm -hmm. And so I just removed the cart itself. And it, it, he's almost, he almost—he almost looks like he's conducting music, an orchestra. Know? I know the content, which I love. And in this, in in the original installation, mm -hmm. along with this piece on a large wall, was the voice of my grandfather, because mm -hmm. he was a street vendor for fifty years, and so he would tell me the history of Tijuana, and I would record it. And so for the exhibition, it was. Um, him telling the, the history of Tijuana because he was one of the early families to come to Tijuana from Guadalajara. And you could hear his voice narrating all these different stories. Um, yeah. Here is a, another overview of the life-size vinyl pieces, along with ceramic pieces that I made of just the gestures of the men. Mm -hmm. On the left-hand side is this guy who reconstructed a 1966 California golf cart to sell burritos. Mm -hmm. And it's really beautiful. And so um, for this um, sculpture, it's very small and I wanted the pedestals to be transparent to play with the scale of the large and the small. Yeah, yeah, and I think what's, what's something uh, that's really interesting about your practice is that, like I said, you work, you, you start in like street photography, but every, there's several elements to your practice that then make its way in different forms. And in our collection, we're lucky to have um, the sculpture. We're lucky to have these vinyl installations, um, and, and these photo, uh, these photos on plexi, you know, all of these things that, and certainly these, these sound installations. So you're moving through different modes that all interconnect to one project. And I think, um, especially when you're talking about your grandfather and how um, there is this kind of uh, sonic element to this installation that we showed at the museum in 2004. Um, it all speaks to this kind of connectedness in your practice, which I think is, is really interesting. Thank you. Sorry, I lost the window. I was trying to get the window back. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, with the work. Where are you? You're here somewhere. There it's, we go. Do you see it? I see it now. It, it got lost for some reason. Someone just tried to <laughs> Sometimes it. it happens. I mean, technology <laughs> these days, honestly. <laughs> I know, I know. Sorry, so you were talking about the, the way that I, that I work, uh, beginning with, you know, basically street photography and right. the modes of translation. And one of the things I love about creating this type of work is the idea of translation um, and really the effects of growing up in the borderlands, being by culture, by bilingual. Um, to me, there's no one truth in that sense. There's not one that is real as opposed to the other. Mm -hmm. of course, when you go to Tijuana, you can get a piggy bank of Bart Simpson that is unofficial licensed, you know, 
Yeah. So I was always really in, in, in the, into, interested in the idea of translation and even mistranslation as well. Yeah, yeah, and I think that that point is something very interesting. So um, just to speak about, you know, the title of the show, To Tame a Wild Tongue, obviously it comes from Gloria Anseldua's, uh, you know, seminal text. And um, it really speaks to this idea of, of translation or, or um, existing in this, this state where it's not just English, it's Spanish, it's not just English or Spanish, it's um, indigenous languages and what it means to really be on the borderland. So I think um, certainly you have, you have that completely, uh, you articulate that so well, especially in this, in this series um, that constantly is translating into different mediums because there isn't one specific medium that can, can really underscore the idea of borderlands or certainly of labor or picturing labor in this right. way. And, and um, we talked about it last time, but you, you mentioned, um, we talked about labor, but we also talked about this um, unknown, unseen, informal economy and how that sipped into you know, the United States. And specifically, when I was at the, in the Bay Area, I also created another series from the same vendors that uh, documented the vendors and the influence mm -hmm. of the borderlands in other cities and how these paleteros, which is the most well-known of the informal economy vendors, you know, end up in major urban cities now across the United States. Right. Yeah, and I think, and it's it's this idea of, of labor being, um, yeah, and certainly these informal economies. And I think there are artists like your work in this labor section, but then certainly we think of uh, Ruben Ochoa, who is also in the section that really brings uh, construction materials into the gallery and what that means to actually highlight the invisible workforce that really do sustain uh, cities. And, and in this way, your informal economy series, I think, does that so well is that um, it's not just city building right there are there are parts of, of informal economies like food food distribution that is you know incredibly important and i know that that brings us you know to when we get later into the talk that um another series you're interested in is ongoing uh, work that you're you're working on is related to food so that just kind of reminds me of this again i think this is something really special about your work is your continual coming around and there's this interconnectedness that's quite it's quite beautiful. So this image I have up now is also from the circus series. Again, we do have, um, if you can see my mouse, we do have um, one of these in the collection. And it's, again, you're working from this singular image and, and transforming that um, in that way, which is really interesting. But then I think I do have one more view, yes, of, of these uh, informal economies works that um, show how you're you're again picturing vendors, um, uh, different types of vendors, and and how that all kind of translates to the the graphic punch of the um, of the first exploded vendor. Mm -hmm. So you can see in in that second on the previous slide uh, the line drawings, the red line drawings um, that basically outline from the photographs themselves. Yeah. Yeah, and I think these these photographs. Um, which would have been in the in the physical show <laughs> also, which is funny because you know when we're thinking about as a curator when you're thinking of planning you know, the shows and everything, um, it, it's just so nice to have different treatment to to like mm -hmm. the same sort of subject, um, and you know we're lucky to have depth of your work in our collection and and this this work in particular is one that we do have in the collection um, and again it's it speaks to this. Uh, treatment of the image of the photograph um, in this this really uh, different way, which is quite nice. I mean, I kind of approach it also as, you know, because I'm influenced a lot by music. Mm -hmm. So I see, you know, that first initial photograph as, say, the original song and the other ones are basically remixes. Yeah. I mean, oh, that's interesting. And especially with the vinyl one, I think, you know, that really comes into play because when you do remixes, there's always like a dub mix or there's right. a, you know, a cum like a cumbia mix and so right. on. I kind of see, you know, that original song, which is the original photograph with the vendors. And then the translation begins to morph into remixes. Yeah, that's incredible to think. I mean, because we, we talked about this a bit, but <laughs> I love when I have new conversations because there are different ways to think about your work right. in that way. 
but um, I had mentioned that we we recently uh, a recent gift to the collection is is right. a vinyl right remix, and I just think those that idea of yeah, of you thinking of your work in in this these kind of like musical terms and this musicality of of your work is so interesting and remix right and and what remixing does and how that translates and yeah I think that's very fascinating and uh, you know that record was made with music. Um, <laughs> with Amen Orejiron and we work as Los Hijackers as a, as a collective and right. we really kind of mine the DNA of like where does cumbia music come from where does mambo music comes from and we did a series of a couple of vinyl albums where we actually remixed um and sampled and and created new songs with um, some of those remixes and sampling field recordings and, and things like that. And right. so we're really interested in the first forms of hybrid music in the Americas. And one of them was cumbia, another one is mambo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's incredible. And I think, and here is a, another installation image from, from that 2004 show. Um, but again, it kind of just like circles back to this idea of remixing um, music in that way. Yeah, that was for the opening. We um, we made a limited edition CD that I think you should have in your collection. I think we might, yeah. <laughs> basically, it's all the field recordings I did when I was making the other exploded uh, vendor video and with my aunt singing and my grandfather telling the stories of Tijuana. Mm -hmm. And so um, for the, uh, actually it wasn't for the opening, for the closing of the show, Mm -hmm. ended up, um, we ended up playing um, the whole 30-minute um, piece and remixing it live. And then it was followed by a DJ set by Nortec, actually. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Um, so also, so we, we spoke about this informal economy series. We also have um, this series of watercolors that um, is included in the border section. And I know there was this great story you had told me before that uh, during ins your installation of the 2004 show, this when is how you kind of stumbled onto this, this series. And I wonder if- When you I was installing that. the Informal Economy exhibition, I took a lunch break and I picked up the newspaper. And in the newspaper was a picture of this four-year-old girl with her legs sticking out of this Powerpuff Girl piñata. Mm -hmm. I thought, wow, what a strange image. And the further I read and the more research I did after the fact, it turns out that where I grew up in Zona Norte is where this is all happening. And basically this is how children and people are smuggled, a lot of children through piñatas and because it's, a, you know, it costs a hundred dollars yeah. to make a custom-made piñata for a four-year-old girl or, or a boy, or it costs $500 to dismantle a um, a series of sections from cars and put people in the cars themselves or get sewn into actual car uh, seats. And so more, you know, again, a lot of the work that I do is really connected to my family, to my experience. Mm -hmm. And so going back to Zona Norte and talking to some people and some family members that also are, you know, I have this um, complicated family that some family members have gone on to be police officers judges, um, drug smugglers, uh, coyotes. I mean, the whole, you know, made for a good Christmas, basically, every yeah. year. And so working from all these sites, I, I come to experience my family or my aunt telling me, hey, there's this new way in which people are being smuggled in, in hollowing out trees, things like that. And I yeah. would go to this studio. Um, anyway, so a lot of that work um, really started to evolve from this watercolor series. And, you know, it's such a harsh reality that to me, uh, I work in so many different medias that I, I just choose the media, the medium, according to the content of the work. Right. And so for me, watercolors is the softest medium in the world, <laughs> in that sense, in the art world. Right. And so I wanted to counteract the harshness of the reality of someone spending four hours in a dashboard or a piñata and, and, and illustrating that in a very soft medium. Right, yeah, and then so the, here is a reference image that, um, that you might have seen, but I think this is the important conversation that is part of, of this section, first of all, um, into Tim Wild Time, but certainly something that you've been, as, as someone that 
again, has personal experience with this. Um, but the border for many is, is, is not something that can be ignored by national identity or things like that. It's something that has to be contested. It's this bifurcated right. space. Um, and um, migration is certainly a, a issue with that. Um, it was kind of painful history. And certainly now when we think of um, the ongoing issues in regards to migration, detention um, in these ways. And it's, um, I think you're right. When you think of a watercolor at first, it, it looks quite beautiful because watercolors are beautiful, right? These muted palettes. And yet there is this kind of darker reality um, impressing upon us as, as we, we see these, um, at first glance, like I said, these just, uh, these beautiful works and, and yet, um, we understand that the harsher reality of what it means and, and what it means to to cross and and uh, stories of crossing, right? They're all um, awful and, and heartbreaking. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's something that we have to contend with and negotiate and, and constantly think of. I mean, as people throughout all of history, we've always migrated. Right. So it, it's a natural occurrence. And I think we need to come to terms with it and figure out a way that um, that migration is a positive thing, that it's not something negative as being portrayed by this current administration. And so we need to figure out different ways um, to, to talk about those issues. Absolutely. Um, so this series for you, I believe, is an ongoing series. It's something that you, mm -hmm. you turn to from time to time. Um, in the collection, we have uh, four right now um and we yeah we're quite you know they're all very different um and but they all um you know of course show different iterations of, of crossing and um one in many ways the tenacity of of these people that are are crossing in ways that they can only think of and, and the inventiveness in this way um as you spoke to vignettas and, and cars and, and things like that. I mean, I think it's also um, these people not wanting to have a coyote um, cross them over, right. where they take the matter into their own hands because the coyotes now are being, um, being, um, being controlled by the cartels, basically. Right. And so it's a lot harder and easier to to not make it across in that sense, whether that means taking uh, your life is in danger. And so um, I really look at, at these people and the resilience of reconnecting with their family here, because some, pe some people in the family cannot go back, so right. they can reconnect by any means possible. And so um, it's incredibly important, especially for the children, um, and so it's very, it's a harsh reality. And, and um, I just wanted to kind of honor that through the series of, of watercolor pieces. And, you know, all the pieces come from images from the INS website or Border Patrol or ICE. Mm -hmm. And so essentially I'm not making any of this up. Basically they come from photographs. Right. Yeah. And I think it's another, again, just speaks to your practice of, of being a photographer, but then certainly these, these images are found images and it's important to to let everyone know that these are indeed found images. They're not, um, they're not the imagination, right? Mm -hmm. um, even though a lot of these, uh, certainly in, in, you know, in washing machines, you might want to hope that it is the imagination, but it's not, you know, and I think this is um, what's so wonderful about this project is in many ways, it's, it raises consciousness about um, the plight of many migrants and, and, mm -hmm. Um, at what lengths this these these people need to to reconnect um, to cross and for whatever reasons escape for, for especially now in our current climate um, and so it's you know it's an incredibly important series for for us to show um, and adds a, a conversation to this section about the border um, mm -hmm. that you know other artists are are certainly working in in issues of migration, um, but then does underscore the idea of, of pain, right? Of pain of being torn apart okay. by this, you know, invisible line for many that, you know, there's this, this beautiful, um, uh, there was a, a 
conference a couple of years ago and it was titled a line that uh, uh, birds cannot see and it was like this idea of crossing and like um you know bird can't see it or you know whatever but it was this this beautiful kind of poetic nod to this reality right that we have right. to contend with yeah i mean i i just finished working as a curator with tanya candiani who was from mm. Tijuana, mexico right. City and so on and so we did a project for five years looking at the the, the current border wall that is being made mm -hmm. and looking at the migration crisis from central america but looking at it through the lens of animals Right. And so essentially it's like this ecology that is going to be interrupted because you now here in Arizona, you have two jaguars for the first time in 50 years that are crossing over back and forth and many other animal species as well. So we ended up creating this whole exhibition with animals to talk about migration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that that's, it's, it is very poetic in that way <laughs> to speak about migration in this way because um, you know, certainly it's, it's damaging to humans, the families are torn apart, we see, um, but then, you know, animals are, need to cross in some, and, you know, there's another exhibition um, about, about like butterflies or the title was, was like about crossing in that way. But all to say, um, certainly I think this, this series does it does speak to your ongoing practice, but then um, about with interest in photography, um, but then obviously this, this kind of darker undertone. Right. Um, and so what we did last time is we talked about these other projects that you're working on. Um, yes. And so this, you had a food project in LA. Um, it feels like a lifetime ago, but it was just last year. It was um, October. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, it was a year ago, but it feels yeah. like just a different, a, a different reality, a different season, if you will, um, of like this reality show that we're in now. Um, and so I wonder if you'll talk a little bit about, about this project for us. So the, this project I did was part of um, a triennial, a public art triennial that the city of Los Angeles with ICA um, created and the previous theme was water. The theme for, for the last one they did was food. And so I worked with my food collaborator, Max Latterier Hedrick, and we've done projects before. Like for example, the first one we did was based on General Vallejo, who was the governor of Alta California before the Mexican-American War. Mm -hmm. And essentially he, um, he negotiated the future of California through an eight hour meal for his captors. And I ended up uh, recreating that dinner with Max and we worked with food anthropologists. We recreated that scene in his house in Sonoma. So they allowed us to film in his house. And, um, and there was a series of dinners that went on. The last one was at Museo Camayo about five years ago. And the dinners were basically what they ate for those eight hours or what we knew of it. And so um, we researched his autobiography that's at UC Berkeley. And, you know, basically the food was, was modern, contemporary, high-end uh, California cuisine. And it was really, it tasted amazing. It was really great. And um, we did it for from 50 people to 300 people for the California Biennial as well. Mm. And so my interest in food lies with having, you know, spent so much time with my grandmother in Tijuana, and and um, and really loving food for the aspect of a dialogue at the table with your family, and so you know food is very important to me and my family, and so I continue making these food projects. And the last one that was created for the city of Los Angeles was based on Carlos Fuentes's book called The Orange Tree, mm -hmm. and in that book it was about the introduction of the orange to the Americas and their short stories. And basically, I was in a space, um, every artist was given a park in Los Angeles to work with. And so for six weeks, we created dinners for up to 300 people. And with that, we also worked with musicians that played unique soundtracks and also with poets. Mm -hmm. So we worked with different poets from different areas of the city. So because the park where I was, Barnstall Park is in East LA, and East Hollywood, I should say. And it's between Little Armenia, Thai town, Korea town, Mayan town. And so we had representatives each week from a different um, area of the city. 
and poets that were Korean, and we had this mutation of Korean food, but also the poets um, brought in their immigration story when they were reading, and basically they took a family recipe and we recreated that family recipe. And you know, we also thought about what they brought from their, their homeland into Los Angeles and how did that recipe change. Mm -hmm. And so that's really the dinners that we were making where um, they were um, food that was brought in from family recipes. So basically their immigration stories told with food. Yeah, that's incredible. And I know the last time we spoke, um, the, you know, the, for example, this is the same plate that you'll see on the next slide. Um, there is like a little hammer, right, uh, uh, or nail that they're okay. meant to break. And I wonder if you can you can tell us about that. Right. So this is a previous um, dinner that we did um, that was based on Leonardo Carrington and uh, Remedios Varos. Um, book about um, erotic dreams and having these recipes to induce erotic dreams and a lot <laughs> of these recipes are unedible so right. then the job was really, the artwork was to make things edible and so the picture you're seeing um, on the right is the, the musician Guillermo Galindo who is transforming water through different frequencies to make it taste different according to different potions that he created like love and air and other elements as well. Mm -hmm. And the other image you see is that some of those utensils, there is no, a lot of times when we work together on these food projects, there's no utensils. You have yeah. to use your hands. Or for this instinct, we actually baked a chicken inside a brick and your utensil was a small hammer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, and I know this is, this is our last image, I, I think, yeah. Um, and it's incredible, I think we talked a little bit about, um, you know, sharing stories through food. Um, and I think in this way it does, it, it's in a similar way to music um, mm -hmm. in the way that you conceive it is, is you're sharing stories, histories, um, and in this way, and I think food is, is really integral to that. It's integral to culture in a similar way that, that music is, um, and certainly, it's funny you, you brought up mambo earlier and I think and how that has transformed in a similar way food has right and I think that's something that you're interested in exploring yeah and uh, you know in a way the last dinner that we did was basically thinking of what is the future in California a hundred years from now what are we gonna no 50 years from now what are we gonna be eating right and so you know I, I did bring out some insects you know Oaxacan insects and people tried it and you know basically you can have two grasshoppers and that gives you the same amount of protein as a whopper yeah you know so when you talk about you know we're also talking about sustainability um and w really what are we going to be eating in 50 years you know so we're going to have to turn into looking at um alternative forms of food like insects where the majority of the world eats insects you know Mm -hmm. And the United States doesn't. And so we're going to have to make a big shift in how we're eating. And um, I, I think um, food also uh, gives us uh, history in that sense, because you can tie in your family history through what you ate at a specific point in time. Mm -hmm. And that never leaves you. You know, that right. is a memory. It's an inherent memory that you have. I mean, like right now I can smell my, my, my grandmother's mole. You know what I mean? And that will, that automatically takes me back to Tijuana when I was 10 years old. Right. So I, I love that idea of the senses. And so whenever we do these food projects, there's, you know, there's sound, there's scent and, and so on. Um, for this other project with the image that you saw, we actually created various perfumes for each course of the, of the dinner. Right. And so you would actually get in your hand a little perfume that you would smell and then it would lead you to the next course. Mm. Yeah, that's, I think that's all, you know, incredible to have a cacophonous um, installation, but obviously olfactory in many ways. And, and certainly food is, is all integral to that. Um, so I know you said that you were also, you're continuing this project or you want to continue your research into food. Um, and so I, I, look forward to, to hearing more about that certainly as it as it develops but i know you might have had a little bit of research that you're interested in 
Right, and and you know this this is like revisionist history, but you know going back when I was working on the Vallejo project, it was right after the watercolor pieces, and I thought, well, you know what, I want to go back and revisit the border before there was a border. Mm -hmm. And this story came about because I saw these monuments dedicated to you know the heroic men that um, that fought in the Mexican American War from the American side, and so. Um, going back to history, I was interested when um, Rex Mexico was ruled by Maximiliano. Mm -hmm. And looking at food again, because him and his chef Tudos basically introduced Latin America to European cuisine. So before that, it wasn't really being made in a, in a large scale, in a national scale. So when you think of birotes, you know, those are baguettes. Yeah. Now, when you think of all these other elements that you think is Mexican in a way, it's not, it's a, it's a fusion. Right. And so again, that remix, um, the translation I'm interested in. And, and for this one, I'm more interested in the translation of history because when you start reading history and, and um, when Maximiliano's death, you know, was documented, my name made the famous painting of, of the execution. Mm -hmm. But in reality, what I've been finding is that his chef died for him. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't die. They're both very similar looking. And Benito Juarez and uh, Maximiliano were both Masons. Mm. And you couldn't, you couldn't call another brother Mason. And so he went off to be a writer in El Salvador. And when you talk to other scholars in El Salvador, they know who this person is. Yeah. And so my next project is that I'm working on a project about Maximiliano and his chef and visiting Querétaro where the execution happened and then going to El Salvador to 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 look somehow for him in that sense. That's incredible. Well <laughs> I I look forward to seeing how it pans out in this post-COVID world. Mm -hmm. um, this sounds like an incredible project and again like I think uh, what's so unique about your project specifically and in, in your practice is that um, your idea of, of how things translate and this idea of translation and how it moves and shifts. Um, so I'm thrilled to see how it turns out. Um, I'll keep you, you know, noted. We have <laughs> apprised. Yes, please do. Um, well, I think, I think that's all the time we have for this mm -hmm. charla. Thank you again for re-recording with me. Um, it's, you know, no technical issues this time, which is great. Um, I mean, thank you for putting together this beautiful curated show from the collection. Thank you. No, I'm, I'm thrilled to have your work in it. And again, um, this was an honor to speak with you and thank you again for, for your time. Okay, well, thank you. We'll talk soon. We'll talk uh, soon. Okay, bye-bye.